Good evening, everybody, and thank you for your interest in U.S. history resources and for all of the important work you do for students every day across the country. I'm Carolyn Jacobs, part of the GBH education team. I'm calling from my home in Southern Maine. These are the waning days of summer, and some of you I know are trying to squeeze in as much vacation time as possible, and here you are on a webinar and others, many of you have already started um, school. We wish you well and hope that what you see this evening helps you ease into the new school year. We are using Zoom webinar as our platform, and that means that the camera and mic are reserved for the presenters, and we are recording, of course. This session is the third in a series of four webinars around US history that we started in March. The first centered around using primary source images and the second using historical fiction to teach US history. And that one featured Lori Halls Anderson, who is the author of the American Seed Trilogy, um, set in the uh, revolutionary period and many, many other award-winning books for young adults. And you will have the recording links to those two webinars as well as uh, resource documents that we create later on in the program. In this third session, we are showcasing many of the new, newly published resources in the just launched US history collection on PBS Learning Media. And when I say newly published, I'm literally talking newly published as of a couple of hours ago. Some of them have just been up with the tech team scrambling to get things up so that we could show them to you this evening. The US history collection is um, on PBS Learning Media produced by GBH with funding from the corporation for public broadcasting. Thank you, CPB. We are sponsored this evening by GBH, Boston's PBS station, and the producer of many iconic series that you see on your stations around the country. Series such as American Experience, Frontline, Nova, Masterpiece, Antiques Roadshow, and lots of programs for kids all are created in Boston at GBH. In the education department, we produce and distribute at no cost educational resources and content for equitable learning and development for everyone, all ages. We're also sponsored by PBS Learning Media, and I hope that this is a familiar site to you. If you're not already familiar, please visit the site and begin to explore and pay particular attention to the new US history collection. This is where you will find everything that you're going to see this evening. The site is free, easy to navigate, provides thousands of supplemental resources for pre-K to 12 across the curriculum, but we are very strong for social studies teachers. Based on the reactions of teachers when they explore the site for the first time, we feel pretty confident that you'll be pleased. A teacher who recently attended one of our webinars commented after she saw some of the resources on the site, and this is a quote, I've been teaching 37 years, where have you been all my life? We love that quote. Give us some more, give us feedback in the uh, chat as we move along. The session is also in collaboration, and we are thrilled to have this collaboration going on. It's been going on through the series, and we are huge fans of NCSS, the National Council for the Social Studies, and Ashante Horton, who is the Meetings and Education Manager, is with us this evening, and she has a few words of welcome. Yes, thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, Welcome everyone. We are so enthusiastic about our partnership with um, GBH throughout this series and the others that will be coming. Um, as mentioned, we are the largest on the slide. <laughs> we are the largest association solely devoted to social studies education. Um, I put the link to our um, 
website into the chat. So I hope if you aren't members of NCSS or you don't know much about us, you come check us out. I'm also going to throw in a link for those of you who are middle and high school uh, teachers who want to start their own honor society. We have a Rho Kappa honor society. So I will drop that now. And I am so looking forward to this great presentation to come. Thanks, Carolyn. And thank you, Ashanti. And we're gonna we're gonna be at NCSS um, in full force in the uh, in early December. The social studies team. These are our presenters. Uh, the social studies team at GBH, with more than fifty years of combined social studies classroom experience, is led by Sue Wilkins, our director. Alicia, along with working with us at GBH, is also a full-time social studies teacher in DC. And Lindsay, curriculum specialist, taught social studies for 11 years before coming to GBH about a year ago. Welcome and thank you, everyone. All right, the um, agenda is very straightforward. Alicia, who you met, some of you met in the beginning uh, for the pre-activity that we had, is going to kick things off and follow up with more about the vaccine um, activity, followed by Sue, who will give an overview of the new U.S. history collection. The team, uh, all three, Alicia, Lindsay, and Sue, will be showcasing several interactive student-facing resources that have just been published, touching on commonly taught topics such as the American Revolution, McCarthy, women's suffrage, and the Freedom Riders. We're going to be doing a lot of switching from slides to going live on the site. So I hope you'll excuse me if, um, or us if we have any hiccups. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia. Thank you, Carolyn. So we opened up our webinar with a warm-up activity that asked you to use the clues in a primary source image to answer a series of questions. You were all spot on with your answers. For example, um, Serge, uh, they said that it's a smallpox inoculation. The author is very critical. The purpose is anti-vax propaganda. Uh, Tiffany was like, ah, oh, it could be the measles, um, measles vaccination. At any rate, it does deal with inoculation, she said. Um, I loved how William, he pointed out, like, look at the banner at the bottom of the page. Um, and then we had, I love how Elaine was able to, <laughs> uh, to kind of make a comparison with today. And so she was like, look, it's smallpox vaccine, not COVID, I don't think, right? Um, so at the end, uh, this image is actually entitled the cowpox or the wonderful effects of the new inoculation. Next slide. This is actually a scene in a vaccine institution and it comes from 1802. Um, it, you can see it's got poor patients, they're crowded around through the door way on the left. In the room, you got those um, whose treatment has definitely had dire consequences. The doctor gashes the patient's arm with his knife while a deformed and ragged boy holds up a bucket of vaccine pop, pop from ye cow. In his back pocket is a pamphlet, The Benefits of the Vaccine Process. He got a miniature cow sprouting or leaping from patients. One person pointed out the pregnant woman um, who uh, stands in profile to the right with the cow protruding from her mouth. I mean, the scene is quite hilarious. So why? Why did we choose this particular image to kind of open up our webinar? We know that as educators for the last two years, we all have been dealing with the challenges of COVID and COVID-related anxiety. I know I personally walked into my classroom last year, the first day, looking like uh, someone getting ready to handle biohazardous chemicals and heels though. <laughs> I was finally feeling a little bit more comfortable when school ended last year, and now I got monkeypox. Monkeypox is on my mind, right? Um, this image, which is included in our history collection, shows us, and it can actually show our students, that virus and vaccine anxiety is nothing new, and the more things change, the more things truly stay the same. Next slide. So the history collection that we're going to present to you today, however, isn't just comprised of interesting images, right? For example, the image that we just analyzed in our warm-up is accompanied by a short video, which we're going to show to you right now. We all know that George Washington is America's founding father. 
But did you know he's also the founding father of mass immunization in America? Now, if Washington had lost the Revolutionary War, there'd be no Washington Monument, no Washington, D.C., and no United States of America. But he very easily could have lost, not so much because of British troops, but because of a virus, smallpox. Smallpox can kill as many as half the people who catch it. It's especially bad in a population with little immunity, like colonial America, where it was comparatively rare. Because the disease spreads mostly through close human contact, gathering people together in, say, a continental army is just asking for trouble. One way to avoid that kind of trouble was inoculation. It's kind of a precursor to our modern-day vaccines. The idea is that you set out to deliberately give somebody smallpox. Yep. Step one, take infectious goop from somebody with a mild case. Step two, squish this goop into a cut in the skin, usually on the arm. And step three, cross your fingers and hope for the best. If you do it right, the survivor gets immunity against smallpox. But there are risks. For instance, when it was tried in Boston during the 1721 outbreak, about 2% of the inoculees died. That's a lot better than the 14% death rate amongst those who caught it naturally, but there was still a lot of opposition. In fact, 18th century anti-vaxxers firebombed the home of the man leading the immunization effort in Boston. They accused him of spreading the disease and defying the will of God, even though he was a minister himself. By the start of the Revolutionary War in 1775, doctors had gotten a lot better at inoculation, but opposition remained. Even George Washington initially thought it was a bad idea to inoculate his men. It would take troops out of the line for weeks at a time. But then, disaster struck. When the Patriot Army was occupying Canada in 1776, logistics were a mess. Men were hungry and starving, and then pow, smallpox. Hundreds died, the survivors fled, Canada was lost. Washington learned his lesson. He wrote to his medical chief that smallpox was something we should have more dread of than the sword of the enemy. He began a comprehensive campaign to inoculate every person in the Continental Army. He had to force some of them, but inoculation helped the Patriots stay the course and win the war. And perhaps that's one reason there's a picture of George Washington on the dollar bill and not say, Her Majesty the Queen. Thank you. I, I hope that you enjoyed uh, that uh, very short history of vaccines in America. And as we can see, it was definitely tied in to an event that happened um, and, uh, during the American Revolutionary War. Um, and I know for me, I'm getting ready to go back to the classroom next week and um, the American Revolution is going to be kind of first in line. Um, and this is an example of the type of videos that we have in our collection. But more importantly, what I love about this also is that in addition to the image that you all analyzed when you first um, were in the waiting room, is that it's also accompanied by a pre and post video activity, complete with an essential question and tiered level of questions to break down the image. Next slide. Now, we were motivated to conduct this webinar because we know that teachers are facing a wave of challenges this year. Teachers are under immense pressure. Uh, for example, uh, the last that we checked in August, we had about 300,000 teacher school staff vacancies were reported. Um, we're dealing with outside scrutiny. We're dealing with our safety concerns. We're dealing with overcrowded classrooms. Some of us are dealing with pressure to address the student loss, learning loss um, that our students uh, suffered from COVID. So we wanted to know before we even get started, what are you most concerned about this year? Next slide. We'd love to hear from you. Um, if you could, in the chat, list the letter next to the choice that best applies to kind of, you know, how you're feeling right now. Are you concerned about dealing with lack of time to cover curriculum, student apathy, you got the workload? I know for me, that's a little thing that's kind of like, you know, got me a little nervous. Are you maybe stuck teaching a course that you're a little unfamiliar with the content? Um, are you expected to differentiate instruction and you're kind of worried about how that's going to actually look, you know, practically in your class? Um, or maybe it's about making the content more inclusive to the population that you're serving. 
So I'm seeing a lot of <laughs> responses and I'm so glad that you all didn't have to think too long uh, for what's on your mind. Like I said, I'm a teacher. I'm feeling the same way so many of you all are. So I'm seeing a lot of, you know, people feeling like, you know, lack of time to cover the curriculum. Um, I'm seeing a lot of that. Yeah, I'm kind of dealing with that as well. I do see some Bs out there, student apathy. Um, and I wonder, you know, this could ignite a whole conversation later on about, you know, the student apathy maybe increase, you know, after COVID and after lockdown, things that we're trying to correct. Um, I got a couple people that threw in some ease in differentiating instruction. Absolutely. Um, and then making the content more inclusive, definitely. Next slide. Well, the next thing you wanted to know, and kind of this is really the purpose of why we're here, is what's your biggest obstacle to using digital resources in your classroom? Um, do you not know kind of where to look for digital resources? Are you completely kind of unaware of how could a digital resource really be integrated into my classroom? Um, do you also feel like, look, I don't have time to incorporate digital activities, but I don't have the time. Or are you like me, you are not computer savvy and, and, and incorporating digital resources makes you a little nervous. Um, can you not find any digital resources that actually relate to your content? Or are you like my students call an OG? Or do you have no obstacles at all? You love tech. All right, so I'm not seeing too many Fs. <laughs> oh, okay, I got a couple. All right, spoke too soon. All right, Eileen. All right, Daniel, I feel you over there. Um, I do see a lot of Cs, lack of time. Yes, 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 yes. All right, yeah, I feel you, Laura, lack of time and A, um, a push. Uh, for those of you who don't know the acronym, um, Advanced Placement United States History. Okay, um, and you just don't know where to look. All right, great. Too many platforms, Jeffrey. I feel you on that one. Excellent, yes, definitely. Next slide. Well, that's why we're all here. All of these issues that we kind of threw in the chat are gonna be issues that we're gonna address in this webinar. As a matter of fact, in this webinar, we plan on answering the following essential question. How can digital resources enhance students' learning experience by guiding students through activities that encourage the exploration of multiple perspectives? We're gonna introduce teachers to exemplar interactive lessons and inter interactive resources from the US History Collection. And we're also gonna provide examples of how interactive lessons can actually be used in the classroom. And Sue Wilkins is gonna walk us through the collection. Great, thanks Alicia and good evening everybody. Um, I'm so excited to share with you the new US History Collection on PBS Learning Media. Uh, and you're looking at the homepage right now. This is a curated collection of supplemental media-rich educational resources for teachers and students of U.S. history, grades 6 to 12. And it is available for you to explore and use now. Please just keep in mind uh, that we are continuing to build this collection and to add new resources on a weekly basis. We will finish this work by late fall. So if you don't see something you need today, please return. The collection will have resources that span the breadth of core topics and periods in US history. And it will also support students in using historical thinking skills to construct meaning out of a past composed of multiple perspectives and stories. So as we look at this homepage, I wanna just point out a few important features. When the collection's fully built out, there will be 360 resources in it. Uh, that's one of the reasons it's so valuable to be able to search for resources within the U.S. History Collection. So you see that white bar at the top that says search U.S. History Collection. When you search within that bar, it keeps you within the collection rather than being taken out into the broader learning media universe, uh, which can be a little bit overwhelming. Uh, in addition to searching within the collection for a resource, you can browse our resources by era and by skill with the aim of helping you locate what you're looking for as quickly and as easily um, as possible. All right, now as Carolyn scrolls down this homepage, you, you will see that we've organized the resources by 16 different historical eras. These should all be pretty familiar to you US history teachers. And then we've also added nine different historical thinking skills. And we will be talking more about these thinking skills um, in this webinar tonight. Most of the resources in the collection um, already existed on PBS Learning Media and come from GBH, uh, as well as eight different partner stations uh, that are listed at the bottom of this page. 
All of our resources, whether new or existing, have had their support materials upgraded and rewritten to provide you with a consistent user experience. So when you come to the US History Collection, you're gonna know what you're gonna find there. All right, so we're gonna look at one of these resources now, and I just wanna give you sort of an overview of, of what you can expect to find. Um, so I imagine that uh, many of you teach the Trail of Tears. And uh, so we're gonna click on, Carolyn's gonna click on Indian Affairs here. <clears throat> that takes you down to one of our Trail of Tears resources. This resource can help you teach this topic. And I, um, you know, I'm just going to point out the fact, first of all, that we uh, provide not full length documentary films because we know that most teachers don't really have the time to show that on a regular basis. Uh, we provide uh, video clips that are um, between three, generally between three and six minutes in length. Um, so I'm going to actually focus, though, on the support materials for teachers and students here. Uh, they all sit to the right of the media in our resources. And for teachers, we provide teaching tips for every resource in the US History Collection, and they are all organized this way. So <clears throat> the overall goal of our teacher tips is to facilitate your use of that resource in the classroom. We identify the essential and supporting questions the media addresses. We provide suggestions for content that we think you should cover with your students before using the resource um, with them, as well as some quick ideas for ways to engage your students with the topic. While viewing questions are designed to focus students while they watch or engage with the media, if the media is a video, the questions are sequential and pretty straightforward. It's, they're really just designed to keep students on task. After viewing questions, provide suggestions for how to bring the resource topic to some closure. And taking it further includes suggestions for additional activities and or research on the topic. Okay, so every resource in the collection has that for teachers. For students, every um, actually we're gonna go to discussion questions first because every resource in the collection has discussion questions. These are three to five higher order critical thinking questions that are directly related to the media. And you could use these as an exit ticket, as an in-class activity, group activity, or as a homework assignment. All right, the next thing I wanna show you is a background reading. About 25%, it probably actually will be a little bit higher, but at least 25% of the collection's resources will have background readings. These all have been redesigned, and some key features that I wanna point out to you are that they all have a title, they all have an essential question to give students that focus when they begin reading. Uh, if it's a long, you know, over a page in length, they'll have subheadings to guide students through the reading. Um, if needed, history vocabulary is defined on the page where it appears. Uh, generally, one to two images have been added to help engage students, and these are written at a ninth grade reading level. And then lastly, um, we're going to show you an activity. 50% of the collection's resources will have student activities that focus on a historical thinking skill and are designed for students to complete with minimal teacher guidance, if any at all. These actually came out of the, you know, the COVID period when teachers really needed um, assignments that they could give to students at home. Uh, we're, we're gonna be showing you several of these activities this evening. Um, so all of the support materials I just reviewed are designed with the expectation that many of you will edit and adapt these for your students and your curriculum needs. We welcome that, we expect that, and we encourage you to make use of these as you, know, as you see fit. Okay, so that's the brief overview. I really do encourage you after the webinar to go and investigate on your own. There's just a lot to see, uh, but right now I'm gonna turn things over to Lindsay. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, so tonight I'm going to start um, highlighting our um, digital interactives by focusing on the early American period and the American Revolution. Um, and the first thing that I want to give you an overview of is an example of one of our interactive maps. I know that many of you, like I did myself when I was teaching, start the school year really in the colonial American history. Um, and I know personally, I often found this a really challenging time period to teach. 
Uh, my students struggled with the archaic language of the time. They felt that the early American period was just so far removed from their own lives. And oftentimes these primary sources that are available to students just seem so inaccessible, again, especially in their language for um, a high school audience. But these maps will give you a really kind of different way for students to start thinking about early American history. So Carolyn is going to graciously go to the website and I'm gonna show you a little bit about what the interactive map does, what it looks like, and how this is really going to allow you all to give students a multi-sensory approach to learning. Um, I really find there's no better way to start the school year than putting student engagement first and by providing these really experiential materials in the hands of students that allow them to explore their own pace. Um, and really our interactives are going to accommodate all these different types of learners that you have in the classroom. So as Carolyn launches the map, you'll see that um, it offers students complete control of what they want to see on when looking on the left hand side and it's broken down into two different categories geography and colonial life so seeing the geographical features that we have such as fields and trees water hills allows students to contemplate the ways in which geography influenced the daily lives of early bostonians the colonial life section of the map which includes features such as schools military facilities, ships and shipyards, churches and meeting houses are going to give students a glimpse into the aspects of daily life that the colonists really valued. And my favorite feature of this map provides a modern day outline of Boston, so demonstrating just how much the city has changed since its early days. But as Sue shared with you earlier, we're not leaving you on your own for this. We've provided um, these interactive student activities so you can easily help students use this in the classroom. So the accompanying student activity is gonna provide these questions to help prompt student exploration. So in this case, we're really getting students to consider how the geography of Boston shaped daily life. So for example, the number of schools and churches will help students see how the colonists valued education and religious life in their own communities, while examining shipyards provide students with a different angle to explore the factors that power the economy of the area. So instead of just having students read the textbook, they really get to delve in um, themselves to start to experience daily life. Next, I'm gonna turn it back to Alicia who can show you an interactive timeline of early America. Hmm. Thank you, Lindsay. Now we know that many of you will be covering the American Revolution and it is so easy to lean primarily on lecture to cover all the events. I know I'm guilty of that. However, in the spirit of lightening the load, um, which is the subject of this webinar, we have designed an interactive lesson that allows guided student exploration. Um, we've already constructed a universal essential question. Students are asked to consider in this interactive lesson, how did a series of policy changes by the British government cause the American colonists to declare independence? I love this interactive and I have already planned to use it in my classroom coming up um, because it comes with a concise history of each event that really helps the students answer the essential question. So students can navigate forward or backwards with ease and all of the upcoming and past events are displayed at the bottom. So instead of you having to lecture, you're allowing the students to explore the timeline on their own. The readings aren't too long, it's nice and concise, and it's very, very easy to navigate among the different events. I also really, really like this interactive lesson because like all of our interactive lessons, it comes with a student activity. In this particular instance, students are responsible for more than simply just zipping through the events. I was reading through the comments and I know that one of the participants here basically argued that one of the things that they're kind of like a little worried about is your students when they use digital um, media, a lot of times they get tired of just clicking, clicking, clicking. Um, and I completely agree with you. Um, we have actually created a graphic organizer and content questions that ensure that they are comprehending, that they're processing and they're actually using the information that they're reading and constantly having to represent refer back to the essential question as they go through the timeline. And as you can see the questions there, you could see the graphic organizer. So they're constantly being held accountable and they're interacting with the material. Uh, 
All right. You know, when I was a student in the 11th grade, I would immediately put my head down on my desk and go night night, <laughs> whenever we would begin a unit on the American Revolution, because I didn't see myself in that narrative or anyone that looked like me. I was left with the impression that the American Revolution only involved um, one particular group of individuals. We've developed an additional interactive image to bring in those untold stories and incorporate those multiple perspectives. So we're actually now going to go to the interactive um, image uh, for Washington Crosses to Delaware. In our Washington Crossing to Delaware, students analyze the popular image and they use it as a springboard to discuss how the revolution was won off of the efforts of many different communities and peoples. I'd like to walk you through how this could be actually used in your classroom. So step one, you could use the painting as a stimulus to activate their prior knowledge about the Revolutionary War. You could begin the lesson by projecting or distributing a handout with the image and have students independently or in groups predict what assumptions they make regarding the war and its participants based solely on the image. Um, if we go on the introduction tab, we could have students launch the interactive and have them click on the introduction to provide historical context of the event and the painting and answer the questions that we provide on a student handout. The next thing you could do is then have students click on each of the hotspots over the individuals highlighted in the painting. As the students read the text, they will learn about the different groups and communities that helped influence the war, such as Blacks, women, Native Americans, and that they are actually represented in the painting, even though so many of us have seen this picture a million times and never, ever noticed them. And once again, they can record their answers on their student activity sheet that we provided. In the end, students will use what they learn to answer the essential question we provided of how was the Revolutionary War won by the efforts of many different groups and communities. Oh. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay. Thanks, Alicia. I want to walk you all through another very familiar image. Okay, I know the name, uh, the title of this image is written on the slide. Let's pretend that you can't see that. Um, I would appreciate anyone if you can drop in the chat, what is this an image of? And then how did you know that? What is this an image of? And what do, how do you know that? Great, I already have a few responses. Yes, it is of the Boston Massacre. Um, and so now welcome to sh have you share in the chat if you've ever used this image in your classroom before. You can do a simple yes um, or no. So drop in the chat if you've used it in the classroom before. Just curious to see responses. Looks like several of you have. This used to be one of my favorite ways to introduce the American Revolution was to show this image. Um, so yes, you are all right. This is an image of the engraving entitled The Boston Massacre. It is one of the most brilliant pieces of propaganda that was used um, in revolutionary America and created by that famous patriot Paul Revere. This resource is also another example of an interactive image. So in this image as well, students are also going to explore those hotspots. So as you saw through Alicia, these hotspots are gonna provide text, um, additional images. Also, when we get out of the revolutionary period, you'll see that more and more of them will have video clips. Unfortunately, we don't have any uh, documentaries of George Washington himself, if only, but I digress. So. What's great about the hotspots is they're gonna highlight text that could be difficult to read. They'll highlight a detail that may go unnoticed at a first glance. And so it's gonna give students that truly immersive experience. So let's start exploring the Boston Massacre in greater in depth, and then discuss how you can use this image to uh, kickstart the school year in your own classroom. 
So um, what I really love about this interactive, and many of you have pointed this out, is that it's taken a primary source that we're all really familiar with, we're comfortable with it, we've used it in our classrooms before, so it can be an easy transition and an easy structure for you to incorporate in your pre, you know, already existing curriculum. So when you open the interactive image, as you saw initially, it gave you a clean copy of the image, so you could have students you know, start to simply observe what they see. And then at the bottom, we're going to see these different layers of the interactive image. And so students can really focus their time on a specific theme. So when you click on it, you saw that there was an introduction, which provided some background. If you click on the image, as Carolyn has, you'll see the title and the artist is going to attribute uh, clearly in those hotspots. Next, if you click on the setting, you'll see how these different hotspots are going to call attention to uh, things like the sky. So it's going to ask students to start to consider why Revere would depict an evening riot with such a light sky. Or have students consider why he didn't show any snow on the ground when we know that the events that happened on March 5th, 1770 in Boston involved colonists throwing snowballs at soldiers. So you'll notice that these hotspots are going to provide some kind of analysis for the image, and they will also give some greater historical content. But as we continue on in our exploration by going to the people, we're going to see a way to easily incorporate multiple perspectives and allow us to really start to immerse ourselves in the crowd, including who was represented that day and whose voices were missing from the engraving, even though many of them, in fact, were in attendance. So I want to call out a couple different hotspots quickly. The first hotspot of Crispus Attucks on the bottom left allows students to learn more about the first uh, man to die in the American Revolution. Attucks, a biracial man of African-American and indigenous descent, was born enslaved in Framingham, Massachusetts. He had escaped his enslaver and became a sailor and a rope maker. But he's also interestingly depicted as a white man in other versions of the engraving. So this kind of allows students to start to kind of explore um, what that could mean or why Revere would make those choices. If we go back to the interactive image and look back at the crowd, in the back left-hand corner, there's going to be one lone woman in the crowd. Let's see if you can spot her. In the back left, there is one lone woman in the crowd. But Revere wasn't actually being inclusive in this. Her presence was actually truly symbolic. He was trying to claim that the British were so barbaric for wanting to attack in a crowd. Look how terrible they are. It was meant to rev up patriot sentiments more than anything else. So were there really no women at the Boston Massacre? That's not accurate. So if we go to the hotspot behind Captain Thomas Preston, which is a nice little cloud of smoke. Oh, the other one. It actually gives some contextual evidence for the women who were in attendance that evening um, and whose testimony in court swore that Captain Preston had not ordered the court, court um, I'm sorry, ordered the soldiers to fire on the crowd. So very well, it could have been um, a few women's testimony that saved him from, from jail or, or any other uncertain fate. Um, so as students start to kind of see this resource now, not just from that textbook piece of propaganda, but as they look at it with the accompanying independent student activity, it's going to start you know, to get them to see how powerful this engraving is, getting this contextual historical evidence that provides a more holistic perspective um, with that multiple perspectives on what became a turning point in the American Revolution or on the road rather to revolution. So um, next, I believe I'm turning it over to Alicia. Or I'm sorry, I'm turning it over to Sue, who's going to wrap up our revolutionary experience. Indeed, yes. Thanks so much. Great. So the the timeline, the images, um, and the maps that you've just seen, those are all what we call interactives, um, and all that means is that students interact uh, with the media on the on the site. Uh, there's no place for them to actually input answers on online. They do all of that work on a student activity handout that we um, provide you with. This, however, is a different, is a different beast. Uh, this is an interactive lesson. 
And interactive lessons are designed to put students at the center of the learning experience. They are student facing, they're student paced sequential lessons on a topic organized around an essential question. And they are filled with text, video, images, graphs, maps, et cetera. Students do all of the work within the lesson and they save their work in the lesson. Um, so there is, you will not see an accompanying student activity, for example, it's all within the interactive lesson. So one goal of these is to free you up to provide more individualized support to students as they work through the lesson and to offer you, you know, a new way to teach the topic. So this lesson um, on Jefferson and Hamilton, the essential question, um, actually, if we could just go back one page, Carolyn, the essential question is down at the bottom. And so everything is organized to help students answer this. Whose vision for the new nation, Thomas Jefferson's or Alexander Hamilton's, do you support and why? Just want to say this is very typical of our resources. We don't tell students what to think. We provide them with historical information and evidence and ultimately ask them what their opinion is based on the evidence. This is also an example of what we mean by multiple perspectives. This lesson highlights two different views across five different um, topics or issues. So on page two, we come to the first of those different topics. And this is, should government be entrusted to the common man? The overall setup on this page is repeated on sub the subsequent pages. Each page begins with a brief description of the issue. There are quotes from each uh, man pertaining to that issue. And that's followed up by a think about question. You could stop here as a class and have everyone discuss this before moving on sort of as a check-in. And then beneath that is a more detailed is more detailed information on each man's position and his reasons for it. This goes well beyond the quotes. And finally, um, as Carolyn was showing you, there's a chart at the bottom of the page and students are asked to fill in the part of the chart for this issue. It's important to know that this chart and the students text will move with them from page to page so that by the end, students should have a completed chart, which will assist them in answering that essential question in paragraph one. The other topics um, addressed, we're just gonna sort of move through this pretty quickly. On page three, uh, students learn um, how each of these men felt about you know, the, the power of the federal government. Was the federal government too powerful, this new government that had been formed? On page four, should the United States be a nation of farmers or manufacturers? On page five, should the United States have a national bank? Uh, if on page six, should the United States support the French Revolution? This is sort of our foreign policy page. And then on the last page, uh, students return to the essential question. And again, this would be filled in now with their responses, and they would use that to actually answer the essential question. So that's what a, an interactive lesson looks like. And we have many of these in the US history collection. Of course, we can't show you everything, um, but uh, this gives you a taste of, of what an interactive lesson is. Great, so let's go to the next slide. So this concludes the first part of the webinar on new interactives and interactive lessons. We've shown you interactive timelines, maps, and images, as well as an interactive lesson. And so, um, uh, as I said, more in development as we speak, so and will soon be added to the collection. So now we just want to briefly pause here and hear from you uh, in the chat. Do you think you would use these interactives and interactive lessons? Could they be useful in your classroom? And if you would adapt them to make them work for you, what would you what would you do? Great. Oh, I love this positive response. <laughs> that's very, that's very good. Great. Wonderful. And again, you know, I'm just seeing someone saying that, you know, that the worksheet feels really comfortable for you. And that's great. Again, we know we are all teachers or former teachers. We know that teachers love to sort of cannibalize uh, resources that they find and, and make them work for themselves. And we we really do encourage you to do that with our resources as well. All right, so I think uh, we need to move forward. 
Okay, so uh, we know that history teachers are expected to teach skills uh, in addition to content, and we want to support you in that work. And to that end, every resource in the U.S. History Collection is, a, is aligned to at least two of these nine uh, historical thinking skills. In this part of the webinar, we're going to focus on how we elevate skill development in our resources. So in our interactive lessons, like the Hamilton Jefferson lesson I just showed you, certain skills are simply embedded you know, throughout uh, those pages. While in our other resources, we have added uh, student activities that focus on one historical thinking skill. And so we're just going to show you a few of those now. Thanks. So teaching students how to think, read, and write as historians is probably one of the most rewarding, but also one of the most challenging skills, I think, to help students master. That's why interactive lessons are such a valuable resource for teachers. They really help develop a student's ability to read analytically and construct written arguments grounded in historical evidence with content from across the U.S. history collection uh, curriculum. It also allows students to write in a self-paced self-directed lesson. So we're all familiar with the term Roaring Twenties to describe the decade of the 1920s. And in this interact interactive lesson, students are compelled to think more critically about that moniker. Three historical themes that were integral to the 1920s, technology and the economy, immigration and migration, and civil rights and civil liberties. As students read, analyze primary sources in the forms of advertisements as they watch videos, and as they take notes, students will prepare to answer the interactive lesson's essential question. To what extent do the 1920s deserve to be known as the Roaring Twenties? With appropriate historical evidence, students will learn how to back their claims as they take a stand on whether or not the Roaring Twenties deserves to be known as the Roaring Twenties. And again, there are places for students to take notes so they can refer back to their work. They can go back to previous selections of the interactive lesson. They need to jog their memory and their final written work will go on the last page. Next slide. So you've heard me reference it before, but another main way that we support the teaching of historical thinking skills is with student activities. These are printable activities that can be completed independently or with a partner, and once again, lightens your load. So let's take a look at this student activity and how it supports the historical thinking skill of analyzing primary sources. And I wanna acknowledge that this is one of several resources in the US history collection on women's suffrage, which is again, one of the collection's major goals of highlighting those multiple perspectives. Our interactive student activity on the Seneca Falls Convention would fit nicely in your lessons around reconstruction or the progressive era or in the modern women's rights movement. After watching the short video on Seneca Falls, students are given a primary source document, the Declaration of Sentiments. Now look, many of us teach Seneca Falls, but we shy away from the Declaration Independent of, of Sentiments because it's a very difficult text. We first provide an essential question to help our students focus as they're reading what specific rights and freedoms were part participants of Seneca Falls most concerned with. Uh, we know that you know it was about you know the the right to vote, but you know there were other uh, rights that they were interested too. Was it um, were they more was it concerned with political rights, economic rights, social rights, religious or intellectual? They will answer that question with the assistance of a graphic organizer to really break that reading down. Students will then use the information they listed in the chart to go back and answer the essential question. One of the things I love about this is that it doesn't just stop there. They're going to take it a step further and they're going to construct a thesis statement using a very, very, very simple template that we provided, which makes for easy grading, which is also always a plus. But the great thing about it is that it's also coming off the heels of an activity that was rigorous and purposeful. Next slide. Central to historical thinking is understanding why events unfolded as they did. 
More important than memorizing dates, names, and places is a student's ability to explain what caused an event to happen when and how it did, as well as to identify the effects of the event in history. That's why we've included interpreting cause and effect as a historical thinking skill that teachers can emphasize in their classrooms. One of several resources that we have in the collection on the Cold War, um, we're gonna show you tonight a media gallery on the role of the press and the rise and fall of Joseph McCarthy. This media, media gallery helps students consider how the press launched uh, basically McCarthy's meteoric rise as a politician, but eventually brought his career to a grinding halt after the Army McCarthy hearings were televised. So after students watch these um, videos in the media gallery, we've included an interactive student activity to help you teach um, how to interpret cause and effect to your students. So I want to draw your attention to a couple things in this resource on the second page. So after again, students have um, watched the videos, uh, they have here a great graphic organizer that they can use to consider the ways in which the press coverage of major national and international events, as well as the news reporters who reported on McCarthy in the Cold War, and actually even McCarthy himself helped him rise to power and then have led to his eventual downfall. As students record in their graphic organizer, they can see structurally um, cause and effect happening um, in historical events. Next slide, please. And as members of a democratic society, it is vital that students develop knowledge of political and governmental systems and institutions and learn how to differentiate fact uh, between fact and fiction. History can inspire student empowerment and efficacy and support their advocacy skills with group discussion, debate, and persuasive speech and essay writing. So in this resource, What Was Freedom Summer, students are introduced to the events of 1964 in order to expand their civic engagement and understanding. And in 1964, over 700 students, black and white, went to Mississippi to have black citizens register to vote uh, and to, uh, as well as to combat other forms of discrimination. But this time I'm going to let our media show you what it can do. So let's take a look at the video before we delve even further into how these resources can help students engage as, as civic leaders. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a militant group in the- Well, there were three components of Freedom Summer. One was voter registration, which would be going door to door, knocking on doors and asking people if they were willing to go down to the courthouse to register to vote. A second and very important component of Freedom Summer were the Freedom Schools. They would teach uh, things that were not taught in black schools in Mississippi. Black schools in Mississippi couldn't teach about black history. They couldn't teach about black literature. So Freedom Schools were set up to do exactly that. And finally, there was the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. It was a parallel political party which basically said that we will send our own delegates to the uh, Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City at the end of August. And we will challenge the uh, all-white delegation to see who would represent the state of Mississippi at the convention. In Jackson, Mississippi, a city of 100,000 whites, 50,000 Negroes, the mayor has prepared for this summer's activity by increasing the police forces, by passing new ordinances against demonstrations, and by purchasing a steel-plated vehicle, a riot control car known locally as Thompson's Tank, named for Mayor Alan Thompson. We are prepared uh, to take care of any law violations to keep down violence. In addition to Thompson's Tank, armor-plated and equipped with nine machine gun positions, the arsenal includes cage trucks for transporting masses of arrested violators, searchlight trucks, each of which can light three city blocks in case of night riots. The Mississippi on the eve of Freedom Summer was on a hair trigger. There was very much a recognition and a debate about is it responsible to bring all those kids into the state, uh, most of whom are probably far too naive to understand what they were getting into in terms of the violent nature of the place. 
are you are you doing this to use people as 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 fodder the thought was well you know we'll do this orientation at oxford ohio and we'll try and tell these kids what they're getting into and make it clear that they really don't have to go <laughs> but you know i don't know that that really could begin to prepare people my grandmother said, we've heard that you're planning on doing something really crazy, going to Mississippi uh, with those SNCC folk, and uh, I'm never going to permit it. With my grandmother, my mom and dad pleading, threatening, I just said, I'm leaving. A girlfriend drove me to the bus station, and my grandmother's parting words were, if you leave, don't ever come back. So after students watch that video of college students, and, and let's be realistic, our, uh, our, our students will be in college soon enough, right? Um, they're, they're almost there at that point. Um, they're going to be asked to consider in their accompanying independent student activity, uh, the definitions of civic understanding, or we've defined it how our political and governmental systems and institutions work, as well as civic engagement, or how individuals or groups can work together to make a difference in their community, often with the intention of creating, changing, or influencing public policy. So as students work through this activity, they'll then consider the choices and decisions that college students working Freedom Summer made in 1964 to reflect more upon what civic understanding and civic engagement means. So at the end of the interactive, um, they'll be asked, I'm sorry, at the end of the um, a worksheet, they'll be asked to complete a letter writing assignment inspired by the experience of Gwendolyn S Simmons. And they'll be asked to consider the ways in which ordinary citizens, especially a diverse group of young people, became civically engaged and knowingly put their lives in danger to further democratic principles. So by putting themselves in the shoes of people like Simmons, students began to understand what would motivate people to participate in the democratic process while also considering that democracy happens beyond voting for president or being elected to office. Next slide. Great, so I'm going to um, introduce sort of the final resource we're gonna have time to share um, tonight. Like the Freedom Summer activity Lindsay just shared with you, this one also focuses on the civil rights era. It also focuses on the civic understanding and engagement um, historical thinking skill. But this activity um, takes a different approach. So the resource is on the Little Rock Nine and the violent resistance to desegregation at Central High School. However, the video here focuses on President Eisenhower's actions, his initial reluctance to get involved, and his ultimate decision to send federal troops into Little Rock. So if we go to the activity, um, in this activity, students learned that the integration of Central High School in Little Rock set up a showdown between state and federal powers. We know, you know, the federal constitution identifies the powers that are given to the federal government, the so-called delegated or enumerated powers, and assumes that all the rest are reserved to the states. It sounds so clear and straightforward. And I know we have students like, you know, fill out those worksheets. It all looks so neat and tidy. But the events in Little Rock and in many of our other resources actually just illustrate how messy, uh, and I put that in quotes, how messy the interpretation of who can do what often is in history. So in step one, after an introduction, students read the Constitution's Supremacy Clause, and then they sort of rewrite it in their own words. I, if I was teaching this and using this in the classroom, I'd stop here and just make sure everybody got that. In step two, students learn about the hierarchy of laws. And if we can keep scrolling down, um, they then answer um, a few short scenarios uh, to check for understanding. Let's see if we can get it, maybe re, um, reload the page. Let's just see if that, there we go. Great, so we have a um, the hierarchy of laws image there. 
And then there are some uh, scenarios to check for understanding below. Again, I would stop here, make sure students are with me. Step three, they watched the video about the events in Little Rock. And in step four, students use all of that informa information to answer these final questions. So, you know, for example, um, who, who's right here? You know, I'm, I'm not going to read through all of these, but, you know, government, Governor Favis prevented Black students from attending all white central high school. Was he within his rights to do so? Why or why not? Students should be able to reference either hierarchy of laws, supremacy clause, something like that in answering that question. Eisenhower sent federal troops into Little Rock to protect the nine Black students at Central High School. Um, was President Eisenhower within his rights to do so? Why or why not? So it's I think this application of civic knowledge to historical events is something that our resources and the media in our resources show students very clearly. Um, we can show students, your students, you know, what these concepts and these rules actually looked like when applied to the real world. And I think that this engages students uh, in a way maybe that a worksheet doesn't, and it moves their understanding to a more meaningful level. Great. So I'm going to turn things back to Carolyn. Thanks so much. I want to remind you that this is number three in a series of four webinars. The first was using um, historic primary source images. You will have the recording link to that and a wealth of resources in a resource document. Also, you'll have the link to that. Uh, our second in the series featured Lori Halls Anderson, the author of um, American Sea Trilogy. And uh, you'll have the link to the recording and the resource document for that also. And that one includes a wealth of suggestions curated by a librarian that we worked with, Jean Steele, who was one of the presenters on the webinar, and um, of recommendations for historical fiction for different grade levels. And this we are thrilled to announce. Um, on October 19th, um, Dr. Tia Miles, the author of All That She Carried, which won the National Book Award last year, along with many, many other awards, is going to be on our fourth webinar in the series. The webinar um, is, is directly related to her book. That's why we were so excited to um, have her agree to come on it. It centers around helping students appreciate that they are the keepers of their family and community's history. History that lives in objects around them, rich with stories that have often been overlooked. We'll be putting together the registration page for this and you will get that uh, soon. We want to give people a chance to register early and a chance to uh, check out the book if you haven't already. And then I want to, um, Ashante, do you want to, if you're still on? Yeah, why don't you invite everybody to the conference? Yes, please join us in Philadelphia, December 2nd through 4th. So it doesn't matter whether you're a K-12 teacher, if you are a college or university faculty, if you are a social studies curriculum designer, specialist, or supervisor, all are welcome and we have plenty of presentations that will suit everyone. I am putting the link in the chat. Um, as I do that, you know, if you check it out, if you are in like a small, um, a, at a small school district or even within like your uh, school itself, we do have group rates available. And for people who may be first timers, um, we have a potential first-timer scholarship that you can apply for, and all of that can be found on our registration page. So please check it out. I hope you'll you'll be there and you'll get to meet your lovely, you know, some of your lovely presenters and fellow social studies colleagues like Denise. So come and join us. Thank you, Ashante, and we can't wait. It's been too long since we've been able to go in person. So. All right, I wanna thank um, the presenters, Ashante for joining us, Denise in the chat, and all of you for all that you do. 
Um, I'm going to, if the presenters want to come back on camera so we can respond to some questions, if you see something in the chat, we did pull a few questions that you, re that you asked, and I thought I would just um, post something to kind of get us started. Um, we did have some people interested in um, how, uh, I'm going to post the question, and I know Alicia, because of what you teach, this might be right up your alley. How can I best use these materials with my high school African-American studies course that focuses on history? You could probably talk oh, about that for a long time, but give, oh, us, yeah. give us a little snippet. Yeah, a little like 15 minute, uh, second slip snippet. I actually teach that in class as well. And I have used so many of these resources and some of the resources that we've developed, I developed that specifically in mind for how I can present that information to my students. So I would just say explore the um, the interactives, explore the collection. And the great thing is that the way that we have the interaction, um, the interactives uh, structured and the teaching tips structured, we give you ideas for warm ups. We give you ideas uh, and give you questions to how to guide the students along while they're watching the videos and, and engaging uh, discussion questions afterwards. Words. And not only that, like um, Sue said, uh, in the end, we also give you ideas for how to further the conversation with other additional activities. We have some activities that are that, that structure around oral histories, some that deal with um, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, there's just a whole bunch of activities. I can't even like, uh, you know, give you without going on and on, but definitely just explore the, uh, the collection and you will be pleasantly surprised surprise that we definitely have it structured in a way that we suggest how you can integrate it into your classroom from the beginning to the end. Thank you, Alicia. Um, before I bring up another question that I uh, from the registration, is there anything, um, Sue, Lindsay, Alicia, or Denise that you noticed in the chat that we should address? I saw some questions dealing with Canvas. I use Canvas exclusively in my district here in DC. And a lot of the resources, um, I have actually, I simply just downloaded as a video or I, uh, or I put the link in Canvas and the students are able to go straight from the link in Canvas to the resource. So um, it does work very, very well with Canvas. You just gotta get in there and just kind of play with it a little bit, but it does work. Yeah, we also saw a couple questions on student rostering um, with folks asking, what if I don't use Google Classroom? How can I roster? I put a link up there, but if you go to pbslearningmedia.org, scroll to the bottom and click about, and you'll be able to get into some additional information about how to roster your students. And that will also um, tell you how to access their work. Yeah, there's a very robust help section on PBS Learning Media with lots of video and um, documents uh, helping you walk through different functionality, like setting up folders, favoriting things, etc. All right, another question. There were several questions about specific marginalized groups, and I think we've answered some of them, but uh, we haven't touched on... Um, the contributions of Asians or other um, or that group of minorities, and I think Sue, you know that something's coming, and you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Yes, definitely. Um, we we definitely will have, I think, pretty good coverage of um, of Asian American history. Um, a lot of that actually is coming from one of the stations that we are partnering with. So um, maybe some of you are familiar with the series um, Asian Americans. Um, so the resources are coming from that film and it really, uh, they really cover, it's really quite, quite the scope of uh, Asian American history. So I'm quite excited about that to bring that into the collection. Um, and while I have the, the microphone here, I just also wanted to say, I saw in the chat that people were talking about how timelines and maps really, you know, ask students to use different types of thinking skills. And I just wanna, I, I really wanna support that. I think sometimes in history, we get wedded to the text, we get wedded to the primary document. And one of the things I love about our resources is we are so wedded to media. We are so wedded to the visual image. And one of the things we just didn't have time to show you tonight are we have these activators 
activator images that you could use at the start of class and you just put up a beautiful image and we provide you with a few questions that get students thinking and get them engaged and you can take attendance or you could check last night's homework while they are working on that. And one of the things I love about it is it's just, it's accessible to all students. Everybody can look at an image and form an opinion about it and have some discussion about it. And I think that's one of our strengths that we really lean into public, public media, of course. And um, I think that engages students on a different level and in a different way. Thanks. Again, thank you everyone for coming and for participating in this. We had a lot of fun putting it together. Um, I, for one, as not a social studies teacher, learned a lot about social studies. And I was I, I got a, a charge out of the Democratic Party um, convention because I did learn the story about uh, Fannie Lou, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer um, and from a PBS program and, and other work that we've done. So anyway, lots of fabulous information. Thank you, everyone.